Hello guys and welcome back to my machine learning series. The last time we looked at the optimal linear decision function given by Bayes decision theory and afterwards looked at the first real learning approach, parameter estimation. Today we are continuing the machine learning series and take a look at the simple nearest centroid classifier and the very popular classification approach by R.A. Fisher called the linear discriminant analysis. But before that, let's see why it is so special and first look at the nearest centroid classifier approach. Like we have done in the previous videos, we will look at two-dimensional space, so each point consists of two features. Otherwise, we won't really be able to visualize it properly. The MOFs is the same for higher dimensions. So, the name of the classifier already suggests the intuition behind the main idea. We have two means, one for class 1 and one for class 2, that we have extracted from some data with the corresponding class labels. If we now observe some new data point, we will simply want to look at the distance of it to each class mean. With that, we can now compare the distance of our new feature vector to each mean and see that we are, in this case at least, closer to mean 1. This means that the new observation will be classified as class 1. Intuitively, we can already imagine how to construct the general linear decision boundary. If we draw the vector from one mean to the other, or just the mean difference vector, we can suspect that this critical point of belonging to class 1 or class 2 is exactly the center of both means. That means, if we extend this point to an orthogonal line, that line will be our visual boundary. Everything to the right of the center of this vector is classified as class 1 and everything to its left as class 2. To fully apply this approach, we will consider two normal Gaussian distributions. Those data points are our training data to calculate, or in this manner, learn the means that we have just looked at. From there we can see on a larger scale how this approach would apply its decision boundary. What we are now looking for is the vector w which originates from zero and where we will later project the data onto to calculate its class. And this vector w is exactly given by the difference of the means, perhaps also normalized. Good. Let's again focus on one new data point that we want to formally classify. What we eventually want to just see is if the projection of the new observation is greater or less than zero. That way we can say that if the decision function returns a positive value to the right of the decision boundary, the observation can be classified as class 1 and if another one is negative, it will be class 2. The issue is that this decision boundary value is not zero and has an offset b from the origin of the coordinate system. But to calculate that offset, we simply project the center of our mean difference vector onto our w. Finally, we can say that our classifier is defined as the sign of the projected new observation minus the offset b. If the result is larger than zero, it's closer to the mean of class 1, and the data is classified as such. And if it is smaller than zero, it belongs to class 2. Okay, that wasn't too complex. Let's try to visually derive the decision boundary for two new data distributions that take on an elongated, cigar-shaped Gaussian form. If we now draw the mean difference vector and then the normal vector at its center, we can see that this result isn't really the optimal decision boundary. Intuitively, we would rotate it a bit more like such. And that's the limitation of this simple approach. It fails when the data is no perfect round symmetric Gaussian, but an elongated one. And to correct for this error, Mr. Fisher, back in the days, developed his linear discriminant analysis. If we for now ignore the mean difference vector and focus on the upscale solution w that the nearest centroid classifier approach gives us and project the data onto that vector, we can mainly see some overlap of the projected data points somewhere between the two means. 
Going back to the unprojected data, this makes sense since if we look at the orientation of the two data distributions to the vector w, we can see two key characteristics. One is that the variance of the distribution will be fairly high when projected onto w, and that the means are pretty close to each other. If we now again look at two one-dimensional projected distributions, we can better see that we don't have the best separability, since we have the mentioned overlap. In that area, it's not safe to say to which class the data would belong. To have the best separability, we want the distributions in projected space to be as far apart as possible. So, in other words, the means have to ideally be distant to each other. Plus, we want to have as little variance as possible, so that the data spreads far less and they again overlap even less. This is what Fisher tried to achieve with his approach. He wants to find the vector w that, formally speaking, maximizes the distance between the projected means and minimizes the variance of each project distribution. Surprisingly, the solution to this problem is fairly simple. You again take the mean difference vector and correct for its error by simply multiplying with the inverse of the so-called within-class scatter matrix which is defined as the sum of both class covariance matrices. The final decision function is then again the same as with the nearest centroid classifier, just with the corrected w. If you quickly want to see the mathematical proof or derivation for this solution, we'll now get to that. Analytically, the optimization problem, also called the Fisher criterion, is to find the w that maximizes the distance between the means and minimizes the variance of each distribution, which is equivalent to maximizing one over the respective term. But let's take a step back and look at the point of maximizing the mean class difference first. What that simply means is that we take the difference of the projected mean of class 1 and class 2 and square it, so we don't have to care about negative distances. If we now rearrange the equation, we get to this one. And what this middle part of the equation is, is simply the so-called between class scatter matrix SB that we just saw in the Fish optimization criterion, and it shows you the covariance structure between the means. A very similar result awaits us when we look at the point of minimizing the variance in each class. So for that, let's write down the formula for the variance of class 1 plus the variance of class 2. And as already announced, we can rearrange this formula a bit and get to this point. And what we now have here between the w transposed and w is the so-called within-class scatter matrix. With those formulations, we can now optimize the Fisher criterion. And as we all know, to find the maximum of an objective function, we set its derivative with regards to w to zero. So, using the respective rules to build the derivative and transforming the equation a bit, we arrive at this point. And what we can see is that if we multiply out the matrices and vectors, this last fraction is in fact just some scalar value that we can call, for example, lambda. Continuing, we will just ignore any unimportant scaling factor, such as this lambda, since we are just looking for the orientation of the vector w and don't really care about its length. What we can now again do is inject the formula for the between class scatter matrix SB and see that we again get a scalar value at the end. Since, just a quick reminder, a 1 times d vector multiplied with a d times 1 vector results in a scalar value. Okay, and as mentioned, we'll yet again ignore the scalar value. And what we are now left to do is multiply the SW matrix over to the other side and we arrive at the final solution. Where, just to be precise, this weird symbol denotes the proportionality. So, to summarize, we have now looked at two approaches of building a linear classifier from two data clouds, or rather distributions. The first, simpler approach, the nearest centroid classifier, provides sufficiently good results 
but only when the respective distributions are, let's say, round. But if those distributions are elongated Gaussians, it fails. That's where Fisher's linear discriminant analysis comes into play, which simply corrects for the error of the nearest centroid classifier by multiplying the mean difference vector with the inverse of the within class scatter matrix, thus rotating it. Nevertheless, one has to say that both approaches are not that robust, meaning that even with only a few outliers in the training data, the constructed decision boundary will pretty much fail. In that case, one can use something like logistic regression. But that was it for today. I hope this video was helpful for understanding and visualizing how the nearest centroid classifier and Fisher's LDA work. If you have enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll try and do more such videos next to my more relaxed uni life videos, since I think they are pretty interesting and cool but I have to say they are quite a bit of work. Nevertheless, you will be able to see my playlist with all my machine learning videos right here. And with that said, as always, thank you very much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.